to end off, we're going to get uh, Chris Burdish up for the uh, sake of the media here. Um, I'm sure, and any of you who might have some questions, if anybody would like to ask Chris any questions, I'm going to hand over to Chris Burdish and uh, yeah, fire away. The first thing I'm going to, if I can just put one to you first, Chris. Um, we know about the, the core strength and the core ability and physicality that's built up paddling a normal sup. You paddling this this Titanic across the ocean. I mean, how much more difficult is it? Have you been on this on that stand-up paddleboard yet in the ocean? And uh, do you know what to expect in terms of the power recovered in paddle strokes or the power needed in paddle strokes? Uh, Jeff, thanks very much. It's a great question, and um, I'll let you know in December after the first day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it is. It's a very difficult one to wrap your head around because no one's ever done anything like this before. You know. In, in the beginning, I actually, we looked at the first time I, I thought of doing the transatlantic, we were going to use a support boat and, uh, you know, it made logic sense. But the more I started researching actually having a support boat, crossing an entire ocean with me that was going to take three and a half months, I, I started to realize that it was actually more problematic and more challenging having a support boat with you than actually doing it um, completely unsupported, as weird as that might sound. Because there's no craft or boat yacht that's designed to be able to travel at such a slow speed and be able to endure three and a half or four months without actually stopping and land you'd need you know 10 crew and the chances of actually having something go wrong with the, your support boat is a lot higher than having actually a problem with yourself if you're self-supported which means you're completely relying reliant on actually the support boat whereas if you if you actually develop the whole project so you're completely supported and sufficient, then the only person that you're relying on is yourself. And I've learned over the last 35 years that the only person that's never let me down is myself. And Yoshi as well. <laughs> I love Yoshi. I swim with, with Yoshi a lot. He's, uh, he's one of my friends. Um, I wish I could take him with me, but he's, he weighs a lot. <laughs> Um, the reason why I don't normally hold beers, but um, I just thought I'd let you guys know because I'm quite proud of it. Um, both myself and, and um, Greg Casey from Banana Jam, an old friend who owns a brewery, um, has helped me over the last eight weeks. We brewed my first ever beer together and it's called Stoked and it's just come out of the brew, brewery this evening. So this is the first one the beer is called stoked and it's actually going to be on tap at the back there you can either ask for jack black which has been donated by ross a really good friend of mine very very um very stoked about that but the beer is called stoked try it out and um, let me know what you think so if anybody's got any questions or queries um i'll take some questions yep hi I'm Di. I've Hi, cried most of the way through everything, so I hope no photos are taken. <laughs> All I want to say is, you're very, very brave. I don't get in the swimming pool, but um, I can't imagine what it'll be like. I, just, I keep wondering if this wall breaks down, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> but, uh, we'll be surrounded by, a, by sushi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. However, I don't think I'll be pleased with any photographer if they take a photo of me tonight. <laughs> I'm actually Craig's wife. But uh, I came along, love you to bits, and right behind you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Featherby. A true inspiration and um, so, proud to, so proud to have her on board. Thanks very much. You, um, Carrick has been an amazing team. Um, any other questions? Before anyone even... Oh, oh, there we go. Didn't have to get to that one. Yes. Sorry, at the back there. Just two questions. Yes. So yeah, uh, roughly three and a half months. So um, we're looking at um, the distance between sh um, Africa, as in Morocco, to the Canaries will probably be 650 k's, which will probably take me about 10 to 12 days, um, and then probably three months between Morocco. I mean, between the Canaries, the Caribbean, and and Florida. But it's very difficult to gauge because no one's ever done this before. Obviously, the craft is um, pretty heavy. 
Um, we've loaded, we've, we've actually done the preload of it to get the balancing right, to get the floor level right, so the distance from the, the water to my stroke is correct. Um, and you know, we've got special ballast tanks that we built in to be able to actually, that I can actually fill up um, from my water um, desalinator to lower the craft to make it more stable so when the conditions get really tough I can actually sink the craft down so it becomes a lot more stable um, to be able to manage it when it gets um, really difficult and you, your question is in getting through the difficult times I think um, you know we I, I try and relate a lot of the things that I do whether it be in big waves or in you know difficult adventures to life you know and we all go through different challenges and difficulties and obstacles and dark times in our life and it's it's just about believing in yourself and knowing that that space that you're in it's not it's not for an extended period of time it's normally just a short period of time and you you've got to know that like a storm and like any difficult time that it's about like they say weathering the storm and the storm's never going to last forever it's going to last for 12 hours 24 hours 36 hours at the most and it will subside and you've just got to be mindful of that and not think about focusing on the moment about how terrible it is and that you want to give up but knowing that it will actually get better and all you got to do is just endure another couple of hours another couple of hours and you'll get through it and there's a famous saying that I, I love which is this too shall pass and no matter how bad things seem you know that this too shall pass and it will get better so it's just about managing a really uncomfortable space and an in uncomfortable headspace for an extended period of time and knowing that it will get better and the, the storm will subside and once the storm subsides the sun will come back out and everything will actually be okay. But you do have to be 100% confident in the craft that you're in when you're in the middle of the ocean and there's no one else around. Because it's not if I'm going to get caught in a storm, it's just how many and how, how I manage that both from a personal, physical and mental and emotional perspective. And this craft that we're building is very, very, very unique. It's very capable. It's bulletproof. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time working on it. Um, we've taken a lot of the qualities from the open ocean rowboats. So I know that no matter what happens, I can get rolled over in the middle of the night um, by a, you know, a 25 foot wave and it will right itself automatically, it will be completely self-sufficient, it won't take in any water. I can lie inside and watch exactly what's happening on the outside on all my instruments. I can see the speed I'm going, the direction I'm traveling, how much current um, I'm in, what, the, how much the wind is helping me, how much I'm going off course, on course, correct the course, and you know, um, you know make a cup of coffee, a good you know, tribe coffee, and um, you know, weather the storm. Um, hopefully listen to some really good audio books. <laughs> I'm going to be spending a lot of time by myself, so um, you know, a lot of people are very uncomfortable with that. I, I really enjoy being out in the ocean. And, it, you know, a lot of people find it as a really fearful and, and, and um, frightening place. And it just, it just depends on your frame of reference. To me, the ocean is the one place that I feel completely comfortable home and at peace. So when I'm out there, I'm home and yes the conditions get trying and when the conditions get really tough I actually that's when I really enjoy it the most <laughs> because it's more challenging and it's it's really about testing yourself and and mentally knowing that you can challenge yourself and how to deal with it mentally to be able to work your way through it and um, yeah there are going to be some difficult times but uh, I think it's going to be an incredible journey and I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of those stories with you so yeah yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, I've spent a hell of a lot of time and um, as I said, I flew over to the UK to meet up with the guys from MRSAT um, and the communication system that we've got on board will mean that I'll be able to make SATCOM calls to my team on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to get updates on the weather, updates on the forecast, routing, everything else and then I'll also actually with the system that I've implemented is I'll be actually be, be able to do live social media updates every day from the middle of the ocean. Um, I won't be answering people, <laughs> but I will be making updates. Um, and you can, you know, then that's a nice thing about, you know, communications these days over the last couple of years have become unbelievable. And we'll be able to send the high-res images and possibly even do live streaming feeds. Um, 
while I'm 3,000 kilometers from land. And I think that just goes to show how small the world has become and um, how incredible the communication systems have become in, in regarding to being able to stay connected. And you know, when the adventurers in the old days used to leave on an adventure, they used to be said, you know, kiss their wife goodbye and say, well, honey, I'll hopefully see you again. <laughs> and if they didn't come back, you know, a month after they amended, then they just weren't going to come back, ever. <laughs> um, whereas th in this day and age, you can track the people live every step of the way so you know what's happening you can get updates every day from them to see what's happening and even if you get you know you have to you get run over by a tank and you have to jump into your life raft you, you know they'll still be able to track you along the way and when people come and rescue you it's not like they're going out for search and rescue because they know exactly where you are so it just means you'll be you know in your life raft for a couple of days and it'll be another cool part of the story and if I run out of food, a lot of people ask, then I'm surrounded by an aquarium of sushi, and I love sushi. <laughs> Sorry, that was a question at the back. <laughs> yeah, 100% correct. And the amazing thing is that even though, you know, even the old sailors in, in the good old days and the adventurers, they actually all use navigation as well. They all use the stars. And I've had to upgrade my, my sailing skipper's ticket to actually include celestial navigation and the old school ways. Because we all rely on technology a lot, but when technology goes wrong and you're out there in the middle of the ocean, you've got to have a backup. No, you don't only have to have a backup, you have to have a backup of the backup and then a backup of that backup. Because it's not if things will go wrong in the ocean, they surely will on a daily basis. So you better have all your stuff together and um, have planned for the worst and hope for the best which is a philosophy I live by so you can make sure that you can deal with anything that might come your way. How many extra paddles would you have? Um, not enough. <laughs> um, I'll be taking three paddles, two that are my normal size, um, two different blades, one with a smaller blade um, for if I, if I get more fatigued then you switch out to a smaller blade which doesn't put as much load on your body and then a smaller um, adjustable paddle which fits in the top of, the, of my cabin which is just as a worst case scenario. And if, um, if that all goes wrong I've got two really small paddles which I will make work <laughs> if I have to. <laughs> The great news is that you know I've got the, the, there's current that goes along the route and there's wind that will all help you, and that's the reason why you know we do downwind stand-up paddleboarding because the wind does help you along the way. So all that will actually help you on your journey. The objective is to do between 40 and 60 kilometers a day um, every day. So I've got to do a marathon a day for 125 days straight. You know we we have measures in place to be able to safeguard anything. Um, we've got like I've got three different um, communication channels and um, you know if one fails then we go to the backup if that fails then we go to a backup of that um, so we've got th this project you know a lot of people think that a lot of the stuff that I do is pretty crazy but people that know me very very well know that I'm absolutely meticulous in my planning and preparation and that's the reason why I'm still here and um, you know the safety measures for this project are are huge and insurmountable because I don't plan on leaving here with, with the objective of not coming back. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that I still want to do and a couple of other projects that people will think are even crazier than this. But um, this, the amount of logistics and the amount of planning and the amount of safety gear that goes and gets put in place to be able to make sure that everything happens and there's a backup and a safety plan for everything is beyond most people's wildest imagination. And there's a reason why this project costs as much as it does because we've put in every possible safety measure to ensure not only my safety but making sure that this project is going to be 100% successful. Sorry. To, yeah. Sorry. No worries. Will you make land all during the trip? Um, yes, we'll definitely. Be, I'll probably be stopping in the Canary, uh, the Canaries, just to do a, a check over the craft, make sure that everything's working properly. If there's anything that needs to be checked, um, fixed, and altered, we'll change it there. I'll drop off um, a lot of the footage that we'll be taking, um, GoPro footage and drone footage and all that kind of stuff, and then do a restock of all the food and nutrition, which is all freeze-dried food, um, equivalent of like three three meals a day. 
um, all fits into into the craft. Um, we have about 40 to 50 liters of water that gets stored in the bladders, which we use as a double up on um, for bladders for for weight um, and as a backup as well. Um, so yes, and then the possibility of landing um, somewhere up the, the leeward island chain of the Caribbean um, is an, is an option if we run if I run short on food or if um, if the forecast and the weather system actually pushes me to an area where I have to stop um, and then carry on going. But at the end of the day, if I can skip it out, uh, I actually will because um, if the currents can and the wind, I can I can navigate my way around, not stopping there. Uh, I'll actually probably just carry on going. Um, less stopping the better. It means I'm going to get to my destination quicker. <laughs> yes. Quick question. Are you using a knee leash or an ankle leash? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the guy that gave me my first stand up paddleboard, Mr. Rob Monroe. Yeah, Rob! It's all your fault, Rob. <laughs> What's the most important one? Have yes. You your mum yet? <laughs> Yes, I have. That's why she's not here tonight. <laughs> um, message from a supporter in Singapore. Singapore. Wow. Okay. Um, message from a supporter in Singapore. Oh wow. Okay. Gentleman. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Chris, I'm I'm here because my son Rob Bagri in Singapore survived schooling with you, <laughs> and he put me on a plane out of Singapore this time last week. And he said to me, Dad, you and Tash, uh, my daughter, his, his sister, he said, I want you at the aquarium for Chris's launch. Rob works with Conservation International out of Singapore in the Asia area. And he said, if any good ideas seem to surface, let me know. And your story about the American who reached into his pocket and was was able to contribute 30 or thereabouts thousand dollars which translates to half a million rand um, made me think in conjunction with your live streaming to this aquarium and through the aquarium to schools and it seems to me that an idea that I can put to Rob is that Conservation International is connected with schools education projects around the world, uh, all of which are connected with funders. And it may well be that through that network you could live stream into many more aquariums and schools around the world and l grow your network of potential funders. So I'll take that message back to Rob but what I'm here for is to bring his message to you saying, go for it, old pal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, what an amazing message. Okay, guys, we've got uh, time for two, two more questions. Last two questions? Anyone? Yes. Mr. Richard Mulvey. Thank you very much. Um, the first time I saw you, Now, I know for certain you've got something else in your mind that you're going to do when you finish this. What are you going to do next? <laughs> well, I've, I've got to try and work out how to get back, so I guess I'll have to paddle back. <laughs> no, I'm going to work on one thing at a time. Um, you know, I, I think half the reason why I'm paddling across there is because the flights are getting so damn expensive. <laughs> and um, trying to lower my carbon footprint. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. I hope you really enjoyed and please donate to support. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And Mareka just wants to say a last quick closing thing. It actually relates to most of the questions that we've heard tonight. Um, besides that um, we all love fish and we follow turtles and their speed and we're going to compare that to what Chris does. Um, we all agree that he's the ultimate waterman so I had a look at the definition of ultimate which is a supreme specialist and what does it mean and it made me think of the 10,000 hour rule which if you practice something for 10 hours you actually become the best at that. So I did a, f a small calculation the other day and worked out that Chris has been on or in the water for about 77,000 hours 
And um, in this next little journey, he's going to be on the water for about 3,000 hours, just to put it all in perspective. So it will be safe, it's well planned, because you don't find a better expert on a sub than Chris Bertish. Thank you. Thanks very much, Samareka Wright, the winner of the Instagram competition. I hope I get the name pronounced right. Berne Heisman, is she here? She there, right? Congratulations! And uh, folks, press packs and info packs are available as you leave. Uh, you're more than welcome to come and watch Ocean Driven, the Chris Burda story. The movie is now going to be showing in the INJ room, and uh, more snacks and drinks available. And uh, once again, thanks very much to all of you for braving the weather to come here tonight. And please keep following Mr. Chris Burda on this massive adventure. Thank you.